Um, so this is a grade of 11 gra 11th grade students. Um, we are in an American history classroom where we use a lot of technology to um, kind of interact both with current events and the historical documents. Um, the students have done a lot of original research out in the communities. Um, they go out with their mobile devices um, on election day to collect information from the polls. Um, and then most recently we used um, a lot of really interesting infographics to um, kind of dissect the, the similarities and differences between the American Revolution and the Egyptian Revolution. And so um, we've used it in a lot of different ways. And so we were going to have, um, if you have specific questions, you can throw it out. The kids are, are pretty savvy with uh, coming up with some quick responses. Or I can have some students just describe the work that they've done and kind of talk about the creativity and innovation as it, as it interplays there. How would you like to handle this, Alan? Yeah, I do have one burning question, because I get this everywhere I go these days. As you probably know, you would not be allowed to do what you did with mobile devices in a lot of school systems in the United States. Students are not allowed to use cell phones and bring in their own devices in schools coast to coast. There are exceptions like yours. I wonder if you could talk about the benefit of using a device like a mobile device that is actually blocked in, pro I'm going to guess, the majority of schools in the United States. So, what do you guys think? Who wants to jump in? Julia? Me? <laughs> uh, um, well, I'll talk um, I, think, I think like cell phones and stuff, um, I think we're, it's much easier to connect to our teachers if we need help. Because they're instead of waiting to come back to school the next day, we can. I've I've texted Miss Lauffenberg. I can say it. Okay. I've, I've texted Miss Lauffenberg and all of my teachers with questions, especially when I was doing like the poll thing and we needed help with interacting with the community at large. We we could just have them at hand. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in on that, Marky? Oh, uh, going over the poll thing, she said. We also needed our teachers' numbers because sometimes they wouldn't let you in the building if you wanted to interview people. You'd be thought of as suspicious, and you'd have to bring up your ID and actually call your teacher, and they'd have to talk to us off the just to make sure you were actually saying what you're doing what you're saying. Does anyone want to comment on whether or not, you know, like th there are very practical reasons for it, but you know, from a creativity standpoint as well, um, for the polling thing specifically, did any of you guys use your phones to collect the video or collect the yeah. audio? Yeah. Yeah. Sam, you want to talk about that? Um, from my polling, I use my phone to record the videos and to upload them onto the internet because my laptop was not working, so our cellular devices come in handy when our laptops are not working. Anybody else want to jump in? Um, I don't know if you can see me. My name is Brenda. and. Um, <laughs> The cameras that we were using were high tech and my battery went dead and I was in the middle of a good interview and I had my phone in handy. Thank God it was fully charged and <laughs> I had, I had uh, lots of space for videos and it, was, it went well. My interview went well. My okay, side. well now that we're past letting students use handheld devices, uh, I would love to hear about the impact of students being engaged during an election. Uh, frankly, I've never heard of that assignment. I'm intrigued by it. And I, w I wonder if you could talk about the value of students physically, along with their mobile device, uh, trying to track the impact of an election. So we've been doing this project for about three years with all of my students throughout those three years of time. and. Um, we don't have school on that day, and so all the students have a day off, and they're super excited to get an assignment with their day off. Um, but what is what I found is that we have now a running three-year log of election stories collected by students in their um, neighborhoods um, at their particular election sites that's just running. And as long as I'm here and can encourage them to continue it, I think it makes for a very nice um, kind of archivable stretch of documentation about what it's really like there um, for for that particular election. We started it with the 2008 election and have been doing it ever since. Um, the reason that I want them to do it is I don't want them to be intimidated at all by, by going to the polls or understanding that whole process. Um, but I'll let them kind of speak to what that day was like for them and, and what value they found in it or didn't find. Okay, hang, hang on. Just before, do I have this right? This is a day off for students. It's a school yeah. holiday. 
and you have them engaged for hours on their feet at a polling yeah. station, yeah. and they're begging to go. I I'm confused. Yeah, this yeah. better. This has to be so motivating. It's going to knock my socks off. Go ahead. Um, we'll let Douglas and then Jeff jump in on this one. Uh, I'm Doug, and uh, hey, Doug. <laughs> basically, uh, when I when I first got the assignment, I was was kind of uh, upset because I I typically enjoy my days off. I like to sleep in, but um, <laughs> after a while, I went to my uh, neighborhood poll uh, place and uh, got the interview. Uh, I used my cell phone, took a video. And uh, it was actually pretty interesting because to interact with people to see why they do this, why they do that. Because I've actually talked to I talked to a few people, and it was a two-part assignment. You can also uh, hand out slips and draw artwork. And uh, me and my friends, we we uh, got together and we uh, drew some artwork saying people go vote. We use uh, chalk and we uh, did it right under a bridge. So uh, after a while, we I it it was an assignment, but it just came it just became something to do on a day off. It just became like something fun. fun. Yeah, something fun to do. So I didn't waste away my life. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff, you want to jump in? Yeah, and then what I did was I went to my local firehouse and I interviewed maybe... Yeah, swing the camera <laughs> some more. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Swing we in. should see you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I went to my local firehouse and interviewed like nine or ten different people and I compiled the interviews so that I asked, you know, one question and it showed the nine and ten different perspectives of what each person thought. And it was also that the questions weren't as much about who do you vote for, but rather they were primarily about what do you know about the election process, what made you come out to vote, and what really influenced your decision to come out and vote. So it was really wow. interesting to hear yeah, why people were coming out. It's really a sophisticated level of questions. I'm impressed. Yes. And the other thing I wanted to jump in with is that, um, that some of the kids got really excited about this. We had kids out chalking the day before to get out the vote, and we had a lot of different aspects of this going on. And you have a bit of skepticism about the average 11th grader getting excited about this kind of stuff. And um, from my perspective, I think this stuff is fascinating. Um, I know most of them don't, but my level of you know helping them along to understand what they're going to see, but then also um, getting excited about it myself, um, I, I definitely think you know I've got to be excited about it, and they definitely fed off of that and ran with it. Um, Luna, why don't you jump in, and then we'll let you know what? May I ask you a question while we're on with you? And we only have five minutes left, so you're going to have to give me some guidance of the best five minutes. Um, my understanding, what are you doing? Are you sleeping in on this day as, as the teacher? <laughs> no. where, where are you yeah. as the teacher? What's your role? All day. Um, can, can I, oh, I'll turn it. So, Alea. Oh. Um, so she's going to say what I was doing on that day. Okay. Um, Ms. Loftenberg was being a teacher while we all were at home. So mm -hmm. it pretty much wasn't a day off. It was pretty much like we were virtually in the classroom, but not really. We were all at home. But um, I started receiving text messages about 6.30 in the morning <laughs> and managed stuff all day. Two of the ladies in here went out at some ridiculously early hour to get theirs. But I also, it's a professional development day for the teachers, so I'm at school managing Facebook posts and te text messages, and then seeing them also post their stuff and sharing it with the staff as it comes in, which is pretty exciting as well. Um, so that's kind of, I, I'm certainly um, up with the students. <laughs> Thank wow. you I'm impressed. Um, okay. So in the three minutes we have left, I know you have so many projects you've done with this class. Do you want to introduce one more concept? So the thing that I think that it is very important to talk about the way that we approach, so the way that I think about technology is that you can either consume it or produce it. And um, I want to talk, let the kids talk a little bit about how we produce content in here because I don't assign a project and then say, hey everybody, you need to create a PowerPoint, it needs to have 10 slides and this is what you'll do. So if somebody could speak to kind of the big ideas that, that go on and then how you produce content. Maxine, if you want to jump in. Um, so. <laughs> Basically, our projects start with uh, Ms. Loftenberg giving us a topic and then giving us a journal question, basically saying, tell me everything you know about this. And it's pretty random at first, and most of us are like, well, we kind of know when this happened, I guess. <laughs> and then we slowly learn more and more, but most of our research and knowledge doesn't come from Ms. Loftenberg sitting there and telling us what, what everything that happened. 
we then have to go through the internet and find primary sources and secondary sources and compile a project at random. It doesn't have to be a PowerPoint, doesn't have to be a paper. It can be almost anything creative we think of. So it could be, you know, like a poster or a movie or a skit. And then we use our information that we found through our primary sources and display the knowledge in a way that's not standard to most schools. And it gives us this way of presenting what we know in a less standard and more knowledgeable, creative way so that we can use our assets of, you know, presentation and, um, and design, which <laughs> are part of, of what we get graded on and use them to better our project. Um, because we don't get graded just on what we know. Um, our knowledge is just as important in our final grade as our design and our process and our reflection. So you don't, you don't feel a sense of anxiety that your teacher didn't tell you 10 pages? No. Well, <laughs> no, no. OK. Uh, well, but here's the thing that I think is interesting as well, and, and this might be a closing thought. And I know it's uncomfortable to, to some people to say this, but what I have found an immense amount of success with with students is presenting them with a compelling idea, an interesting um, topic to go after, and then really letting them go after it in the path and in the way that is most, um, you know, most about their storytelling and their research and their inquiry. And it isn't about me. Um, school needs to be less about the teacher and more about the student because they can unleash this intense amount of compelling research and projects if you leave them to do it. Um, if I went around and micromanaged all their projects, I would get a bunch of projects that looks like I did them. That is, I am the least creative person in this classroom right now. Um, but what I am good at is continuing to push them, ask questions, keep them on track, and what comes at the end is something they truly own and feel good about uh, accomplishing something for themselves because it isn't about me. It's about them and their learning. And I think we're getting that more and more right each day that we attempt that here um, at our school. So. I don't know if we're out of time or that can be our closing thought, but um. no, that was that was an amazing closing thought. I do want to point out that I know you said less about the teacher and, and more about the learners, which I, I, I respect that. At the same time, you are doing a tremendous amount of stuff in the background. You're setting the parameters. So I just want to point out that it's very creative work. And I think I think the role of the teacher is more important than ever, not less. Would, would, that, would you agree with that part? I don't disagree with any of that. But in terms of the classroom time spent, yes. it needs to empower more of the student voice, yes. more of the student choice, more of the student action in learning, rather than me talking <laughs> at them. I, I, I worked a ridiculously silly amount of hours to make a lot of this come together. But when it comes to them producing their own learning, it isn't about me. Yeah. That's kind of what I mean in that. Yes. Letting them own their own products. Who owns the learning? Micromanaging. Yes. And in the, in the one minute, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by a lot of things you do. But I'm particularly intrigued by this Egypt revolution, American revolution. I know the hashtag for Egypt on Twitter is Egypt. I've been following that on Twitter. And I wonder if you could just make, just make some comments on comparing revolutions. Because that's typically not how we teach the American Revolution, comparing it to one that's currently happening. So you want to jump in? Or why don't you jump in? Oh. Yeah, just kind of talk about what we did in class about that. Uh, for, the, uh, for the Egypt and American Revolution, it first started off like a general question, like a lot of the other stuff started off with. Like, what do we know about the <laughs> Egyptian Revolution and what do we know about the American Revolution? And so that way we can get a kind of a groundwork to find out where we would go from there. And uh, we, then, we made a ch then we made a chart of like, we made a chart of 10 questions, or like a, a certain amount of, a, a couple questions. And we filled out facts about each thing in the different, in the different revolutions, like deciding factors, uh, when they happened, who was in, who was in charge of them, and a whole bunch of th th there wasn't set questions you chose as long as they related to the topic. You could basically make your own questions. Or let me and, jump in for a second. Does anybody want to then comment on kind of how we handled that in class with how we picked up the information on Egypt? Do you want to jump in? Or there wasn't a raised hand. I mean, um, well, yes, with current events. Well, for the Egyptian Revolution, we 
mostly just Wappenberg always talks to us about current events all the time since we get into class. So that's another reason to get like really into like how is this just like our own revolution? And then yes. another way she kind of inspired us to get into it was she actually played the song War, which made it <laughs> so much more fun to do. <laughs> um, and also, I think the current events aspect is, is really important because taking something that kids can feel on a daily basis and see popping up on Facebook and Twitter and in the news feed and, and every day and linking it to a historical concept that seems so foreign and distant and unrelated and, and showing both where they intersect and where they're quite different allows them to solidify that particular theme in a very meaningful and relevant way. And so we use current events that way um, in order to do that. We did a very traditional essay with the result of it. Yes. Um, this wasn't a super high tech thing, but the steady stream of news coming in and every day, watching um, the Twitter feed for Andy Carvin um, through NPR and watching every day this information come through, there was a, a beautiful um, and still building infographic um, on The Guardian. That you know, I'm gonna have to cut you off. <laughs> Sorry. I hate to do this. I hate to do this. But part of my job is time management. You gotcha. guys are amazing. I bet you're going to be more engaged in our society than the average class. <laughs> Go, guys. Thanks. Yay. All good. So you'll have to help me out here. Do we have time for audience response here, or are we moving right on to the next uh, Skype classroom? We're moving right on. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to switch them out. Yay. Bye bye, guys. Oh, now we're going to the Midwest. That's us. Midwest. Hey, guys, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we can. Okay, so you're somewhere in the mysterious Midwest. Yes. That would be Worcester in Massachusetts, where I'm from. Um, but you're not, different state. What, what intrigues me is that this is the story of two teachers about 50 miles apart who have classroom collaboration where you're actually engaged over a multi-year project in your students writing what's the equivalent of a textbook and beyond for, for history. And I even have looked at your, your wiki where you can look at the history tab and I've noticed that there are any number of entries of your students in the months of July and June and August when school isn't even in session. And I, I don't think I see a lot of classrooms where students are doing work the summer after they finish a class wanting to make a contribution. So it's really an amazing piece of work. And if, and if you could give us background to this project and where you see this going, with, of course, some student input. I guess, uh, Mr. November, I want to start first by just commenting on what you just said about the kids at the summer. On Monday, I got an email from a student at the uh, in 11th grade who said, I just happened to look at my page, and it doesn't look as good as the other kids. Can I now edit it? So he uh, edited it this week up at the high school. Um, he's now a junior editing that page of the book. So I know he's watching, and I know he's interested. He's, he works every summer on the online book. so. I, I just think that that's important to, to note that he's still out there producing. So I guess we'll start with uh, Mike was a student teacher of mine about five years ago. And we decided that uh, we had a central question, how do we engage kids in content? And we were trying to figure out how to engage kids in true content to where it wasn't a, a memorization of information, but it was a understanding of how historical events impact the world around them and impact them today. And so, Mike, you want to talk a little bit there about how we pulled that off? Well, the first year, uh, it really became an end-of-the-year project. There's about three, four weeks of school left, and that's when the, the basis of the book, the foundations were laid. Uh, for no credit, no grade, students were engaged in, in creating these pages on their own for the, for the sake of learning. Uh, and then when the year came to an end and my student teaching ended, I got hired in a district, like you said, about 50 miles away. Uh, and Garth and I saw the opportunity to keep this book going and actually engage both of our classrooms, both of our schools, uh, in learning together, creating this online community of knowledge. Uh, and, and it's just blown up over the last five years. Uh, this year we've introduced uh, some web quests we've used together, and, and we tend to Skype as much as we can a couple times a week for a while there uh, to let kids kind of see each other and be involved in the learning process. Uh, and, and the book has just become an amazing work. Uh, all student produced, student edited, student created, everything from podcasts and iMovies, um, to content that they find and source out from other points of the web. 
So do you, do you foresee the day where you will not be buying textbooks, but you'll be using all student-generated work in helping future years? I think the goal is that, that this project doesn't just become something uh, in the seventh grade between our two classrooms, but it becomes a textbook, a, a, a source of knowledge that can follow these students all the way through graduation. Uh, something they can go back to when they start doing American history or, or when they start doing the early Western Civ, late Western Civ. So that it does, it becomes a free uh, online resource and we eliminate the need for an actual paper textbook. I mean, even in the last uh, few weeks, we've been uh, getting emails from people all over the country. There are school districts in Ohio that are using this book. There are school districts in Louisiana that have, have been looking at the book that have joined. We've got kids from Texas that have joined this book that are uh, adding to it and, and doing it. So we're, we're seeing people spread beyond the two schools that started it, but it continues to build and the quality of what's inside continues to get better. Um, I envision that next year will be the first year we truly use it as the main source of information for the students. Um, we have a book that they take home at the beginning of the year and then that's about as far as it goes. They keep it until the end of school and then they bring it back to me. Uh, we don't do a lot of textbook work, but we have been building on the online book with movies. This year, um, each year we tried to extend it one thing. We got a base of knowledge, so we had chapters written or pages written. And then each year we began to say, well, we want to add political cartoons. So some of the kids drew their own cartoons. We scanned them, put them into the book. Then we wanted um, kids to create iMovies or podcasts. So now kids are beginning to upload their own podcasts, their own iMovies um, that explain historical content to a larger audience than, you know, this classroom we're sitting in today. You know, I'm, in, I'm intrigued that this is ongoing work over multiple years. I mean, most assignments that we give students are short ones. Today's assignment is due tomorrow. And that's the end of it. It doesn't add up to a tome of work like yours is, tome of work. Do, and I asked this question earlier in the uh, math tutorial. When students see the work of other students and it's already covered a certain section, does that demotivate them because it's already been covered or does it motivate them to go on and add more work? I'm going to let one of the students answer that. Um, well, once somebody's already done a subject, I think it motivates you to do more work because you see how much they've done, and, but you see now that you can expand further and you see how you can fix it. And it makes it easier because they've kind of like laid out a base for you. And now you can go on to subjects that you think are more intriguing and you can um, add more. So I think it motivates you to add more of your own work. And if, if I could ask the students, just check my understanding. They're not getting a grade for this contribution, is that correct? Yeah, we're not getting grade. Okay, well, help me understand this because the general design of school as I've known it is that the reason we give you grades is to motivate you to do your best work. But you do not have grades and some of you are working in the summer, and today I hear years later, what's the motivation if it's not getting a grade from your teacher? I think the motivation is just to help the other kids so that like, you know you're doing something to help everybody else understand the context of what you're learning better. So it's more for just like happiness of helping people. <laughs> so, it's that intrinsic learning, that intrinsic it's love intrinsic of learning. intrinsic learning. But, but earlier, I don't know if you were tuned in, you're probably getting ready, we were talking about purpose, that, that the work you're doing has personal purpose, you think you're making a contribution, the work you're doing is a contribution, and it, and it sounds like that's a consistent kind of thinking at your end, that you, you actually have purpose, and that's why you don't need your teacher to grade you. Is, 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 could we, is happiness purpose? Well, yeah, definitely, Mr. November. It's a huge purpose because you know that even in coming years, other people will be adding to the work until maybe in five to ten years you'll have an amazing database of information that wasn't there before. And it's good information that has been verified many times and it's all student created. Okay, hang on, guys. I'm just going to see if anybody here has a question for the folks in Ohio. Any students have a question or teachers or parents? being able to produce a tome over years with no grades. Yes. 
It's something you mentioned earlier, and it seems to be keep, keep coming back, which is almost a sense of ownership of the work, this pride in, in being part of the process rather than being talked to. Yes. You're actually developing it, and it's, it's very primal. It's almost Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is kind of what you're speaking about, this, this sense of ownership and pride in the work. And I, I'm curious if, if, you, if you students could speak to that, if you feel a sense of wanting to learn because you have this sense of ownership, that, it, that it's part of your own personal interest, and that's what drives you. Did you hear that? Anybody? Yeah, we heard it. Oh, good. Talk about this. Talk about what you just did. You got um, it? Uh, definitely, it's, Sorry. it's something about personal pride, because usually when you do an assignment, you're doing it for a grade, and you know it'll help you, obviously, to get better grades. But in these, not only do you get a good grade, but you know that you're helping future generations learn. And as I said before, in many years, this will pay off and you'll have a huge database of information. And you look back and you think, well, I worked hard on that, uh, not only to get a good grade, but uh, I was part of something great that has helped others. And it's also for leaving positive digital footprints, because in many years to come, we can look back on it and think, Wow, look at what our school did to help others. Right, digital right. footprints. Oh, I like that one. Any other questions from the audience? I, I have some in case you don't. We're OK? All right. Well, I want to add one more thing, Mr. November, before we go. We, this year, our ultimate plan, we've got cartoons, we've got movies, we've got podcasts. This year, we're doing uh, one more piece. We've, we've uh, got about 15 PhDs signed up. So in the next couple of weeks, we are going to be having the kids using Skype, doing uh, interviews with people for each page of the book. So as of next year, or really probably by the end of, or beginning of June when school's out, we will have a podcast on each page with experts, true experts in the field. Uh, Mike and I are, you know, we're, we're teachers. We, we know our content, but we don't, we aren't experts. And so, um, you know, I, one story I think is relevant too is we, we were, I was talking to some of the kids the other day in the hall and the, the question came up or they were basically saying, thanks for all you're doing for us. And I said, the reality is I've just opened the door and got out of your way. I've just let you do what you're capable of doing. Um, instead of being in control and assigning, I know you started the, the presentation with the concept of shifting control and allowing students to take ownership and control and constructing their own knowledge. And I think that's what ultimately the book is about, is trying to get the kids to take control of their own learning and to see that legacy they're building over time and to continue to look back to see how they've impacted the world at large. Well, and also the dynamics of how you guys are managing this as teachers is there's two of you. And you know, ordinarily it's one teacher in a classroom and, and there probably isn't still a lot of collaboration of teachers, although in the world outside of education, in the work world, there's certainly more and more collaboration of professionals. And so if we could just for a moment focus on the professional collaboration between the two teachers I think that could be an inspiration to teachers who now find themselves working really alone, even though they're in an internet-connected classroom. But I think for Garth and I, you know, it started out as kind of this working relationship that grew into a, to a, a friendship. At the end of my student teaching, our families went to Disney World together uh, to kind of celebrate the year and what we'd done. <laughs> There's pictures, it's true. But Garth and I live almost two hours away from each other, and most of what we do is via Skype. We don't even actually see each other face. This is the first time I've seen Garth in a while, uh, face to face, uh, because of the distance. So technology really makes this possible. But it's the collaboration piece. If we want to model to our students uh, how the real world works, and the fact that, like Garth said, we're teachers. We don't know everything. And, and we need to admit to that, and we need to let our students see that we need help sometimes. Uh, we need to work together just as much as they do. Uh, to leave a good digital footprint and, and to contribute something to the world. Well, as well as the online book, we have this online book where the kids are working together. We have a, a combined blog, so students from both of our districts use the same blog. There's just my blog and his blog. And the kids can comment on my posts or they can comment on his posts. Um, we just proceeded to teach the same exact web quest. Um, it was a nine-week web quest that went on for a long time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it went on for a long time, but um, we did the flip teaching. Mike and I um, chose to do all of our lectures in podcast form and put them right into the web quest. We did it via Skype and Google Docs at our separate houses. Uh, we posted it all up on the blog, so it was at the common blog. The kids came to it. Um, they could listen to the, these mini lectures whenever they chose. They could rewind. They could fast forward. They could proceed through their um, their work. Then 
you know, they were building their own blogs, role playing the situation. And then some of those blogs have actually then been, in a sense, promoted up onto the online book for future generations to lead those blogs of what it was like to live through the Middle Ages from a certain character's perspective. So I, I don't know if they're able to pull up the links. We sent some links to where you can see some of this. I don't know if that's plausible or if you're able to do that. But uh, yeah, what we're, th thanks for saying that. Uh, the, the engineers here are now pulling up your web pages, Teachers for Tomorrow, and they're showing the, uh, the wiki. Um, it has tabs, and it, it shows some of the writing your students have done and maybe some of the, uh, the illustration. Uh, so that folks over the web can see this. And while they're, while they're showing that, I have a question about, you're talking about, I forget the number, 13, 15 PhDs are going to be interviewed by your students this year. Can you just explain a little bit about how did you go about finding that number of PhDs who are willing to be interviewed by, by kids at school? You, you, you send out a lot of emails to every local college and you, you pray you get a good ratio return back. It's actually amazing how many professors are willing to do this and willing to work with you. Uh, luckily, Garth and I have some connections at a couple universities, so that helps. But, you know, you just have to take a risk and do it. And that's what a lot of this stuff's about, is taking a risk. I was, you comment on the professor from UMass. Oh, UMass. Um, yeah, UMass. Shout She's out to tell UMass. you a little story here about that just happened last week so, when he was working on the online book. Um, I was doing a project on Mansa Musa for the online book and I was looking for images of him and I clicked on this one image and it was a wiki and it said uh, reference for history teachers I think so I clicked on it because I thought it was interesting and um, so it was a wiki that was really similar to ours only it was for teachers because this was a college that was preparing teachers for um, uh, when they actually go into the field and um, at the bottom of the page, there was an email and a phone number of the professor who started this wiki. And so um, I think I emailed him like a week ago, and he emailed us back the next day saying, um, hi, I think it's great that uh, you have seen my wiki. And he said he actually wanted to keep talking to us, and he wanted to interact more. Well, and they, they offered you feedback on his page. He offered some feedback of how he could change his page and what to add to that page. So independently of anything I created, he's able to make a connection. Uh, I mean, I was CC'd, so I was in all the emails and knew what was going on. But uh, he was to be able to make an independent connection with an undergraduate professor at UMass uh, uh, that teaches social studies teachers how to teach in a public school. So it was rather interesting. I mean, but again, that was last week. So we're seeing that continually happen where where kids are making connections to some degree on their own. We do live in a region that has a lot of universities. Um, there are a lot of universities in this region, and so we are able to contact and have been fortunate where we might know a, you know, a professor who will then send an email out, a personal one. We, we have letters we write and send out, and uh, the feedback has been very good. We've got, we've got too many professors for the topics we teach, we, <laughs> so we'll, we'll manage them. We'll filter, yeah. So not only are you teaching your students good research, make a difference, add value with purpose. But if the young man was talking about emailing the professor at UMass, you're also teaching them to take initiative and have courage of global communication. My, my guess is he would have done this without asking your permission. He would probably <laughs> ask my permission, <laughs> actually. He probably would have asked, but he was ready to do it. As soon as he came up, he's like, I think I want to email this guy. but. Do you think it's okay? I'm like, he's a university professor. I think it would be all right. But um, definitely you see kids being self-directed. Um, you know, a student here you know, to my left has done a series of movies he's put on YouTube that are, uh, uh, he's, he's just doing movies all year. That was, I, I watched him build his first one and I was uh, so overly impressed. I said, that's your job. And the research he does, uh, talk a little bit about the last one you just did and, and how much, I mean, self -direct, talked about self-directed learning. What he's doing is very self-directed. He needs to talk a little bit about that. Well, you know what? In the interest of time management, we have some queries from this audience we'd like to get to, because we're going to have to move on. And uh, so I'm going to turn this direction. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, so uh, my name is Douglas West, and I'm with Green Dot uh, Public Schools here in Los Angeles. And um, uh, we, we're sort of known somewhat for having uh, taken over and turned around Lock High School in Watts here. 
And we recently had a group of uh, students go to Washington, D.C. They were a finalist in a Cyber Patriots competition that was uh, sponsored by the U.S. Air Force. Um, and it was the only inner city school that sent a team to Washington to compete on this. And they were, uh, it's a competition based on hacking uh, other computers globally and protecting your own computers. And there were 180 teams uh, participating globally from as far away as Singapore and China and, and so forth. And um, there were 12 teams went to the finals sponsored by the US Air Force in DC. And, it was, and these students that went from Locke High School in Watts were um, uh, teaching their teachers uh, how to do this work and, and to program code in about four or five different languages. Um, my question for you at this point becomes, given that and given what you're doing, is how do you, if your students are sort of working in some ways ahead of you in some areas, how do you measure learning uh, as a teacher? How do, do we, oh, if we're moving maybe beyond grades in, in this way, how do you know when a student needs support, um, when they're struggling, um, uh, if they're not necessarily telling you or don't know how to tell you that? Um, and maybe this is a question for students as well. How do you uh, ask your teachers for support? How do you know that you're doing well or not doing well when you're working in this sphere? Wonderful question. So how do you know what assessment looks like, especially if you're ahead of your teacher? Um, well, I think like regarding um, asking for support or help or if we have a question on something, I, just, speak louder. I think we could just, um, I think we can just really go to them and ask um, you know, for advice, or you know, it, it show them and see, you know, is this is this you know a good blog, or is this you know a good addition to the online book, or whatever the project that we're working on is. And I I think that there still is like a lot of interacting with support and you know advice. I, I wonder I wonder if I could ask a question related to your question. My understanding is they have flipped the classroom, so instead of taking up their time as teachers transferring knowledge, they're more available during class time for one-to-one -one personalization of instruction, if I have it right, which would lead them to be able to give students guidance who are ahead of them. So it sounds like the ecology of the whole system, that the flip model and other variables like that might become increasingly important so that teachers can give guidance instead of transferring knowledge during that time. You know, Alan, one other thing we point out, we've also um, done a lot of mastery stuff, a mastery level course. So there are quizzes kids can take at their own paces, a traditional quiz. We still have standardized testing we have to take. We still have, you know, all the testing that everybody else has to do. We're responsible to meet those requirements. So we've still built in um, short answer and, and multiple choice questions, much like the, the state exams are. But they're mastery level, and kids work at their own pace, and they show mastery of those that content. Usually, we say 80 percent or better, um, and so kids are able to continue to work and to learn. If they miss specific things, what Mike and I talked about, and we do a lot of reflection together, is the problem with our web quest was that we asked. Yeah, too many you know what, Garth, questions. I'm going to have to cut you off. I hate okay. to do this, but we've got uh, an incredible time management issue, and it's my job to do it. So okay. thanks for thanks for getting together, guys. I appreciate that you uh, overcame distance thanks today. For all good. It. Thanks, kids. Yay. So off we go. We, we keep moving around the United States, don't we? Uh, here, let me, let me just refer to my notes. Oh, these guys. OK. Um, well, what, what, pardon? Oh, we can do names? Whole names? No, wait, wait. I, I'm getting, where's the lawyer? I need the lawyer. First names. OK. Um, we're going to hear from Aaron and Jonathan, uh, who are chemistry teachers in, the, uh, in a mountainous region of this country. And I actually know these guys, too, um, from an earlier podcast I did. But while we're waiting for them to come on, and this, this is a fairly, you're going to hear a fairly serious uh, story of flipping a chemistry classroom. So most of, oh, here, guys. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. I, didn't, I didn't see you sneak up on me. Uh, why don't you explain? I don't want to explain. You guys help me understand that you have dangerous chemicals in a classroom, and you're allowing students to do different experiments at the same time while you're managing all of that. You have videotaped your lectures. 
so that you've flipped the classroom. Is, is yeah, that that's close exactly to the truth? Right. Yeah, so what, what we've basically done is we're able to manage the chaos of multiple students doing multiple as we no longer um, talk directly to our class that we've made uh, we've made videos of all of our direct instruction students watch that at home and they come to class they're there to work and once we had a library of videos we said why does every kid have to do the same thing on the same day let's just open it up we'll give them weekly benchmarks and say get there and they get there by doing a million things and we run around and manage the chaos in fact I would say we, we've kind of taken it a step further we're calling it the flip instead of the kids just all watching the same video on the same night the kids actually are moving at their own pace through the content when they're ready. When they get to the end of a unit of study, they take a summative assessment, or a big test for people who don't know what that means, and they, uh, if they don't get a good enough grade um, then, and to master the content, we make them go back and make sure they learn it. You see, chemistry, you have to build so much. E gets to D. If you don't get A, by the time you get to D, you're lost. So we're learning the content. Well, it intrigues me again. You're, you're the uh, second pair of teachers we've talked to today. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a partner teacher collaborating on this work, what would the difference be? Well, one, uh, there's a couple uh, things that we have found very valuable, valuable in working together. Um, when we first started making these videos, and I would take unit two and so on. That made it really manageable to get started, get into it. You know, work smarter, not harder. We split the workload in half. Now, we um, decided to remake all of the videos, and we had done a couple together, and the feedback we got from our students was largely, we like it when you do it together, because there's a conversation going on about the content area. It's just not one person giving a bunch of information. We have a conversation, and there's actually some research uh, that's recently yeah. been done about that as well. So. Um, the, the research has basically said that if uh, some science videos, if you just have a science video, the kids actually don't learn that well from it. They can get some misconceptions. Instead, if there's a conversation, and so we kind of take roles. Yeah. I'll play the dummy, and Aaron will be the chemistry expert. I'll kind of take the role of the sort of ask that question that I know the kids actually are trying to figure out the answer to, and that dialogue really um, enhances the learning experience for the kids. Right. So the research study we're referring to actually. Um, cited the fact that if you anticipate the common misconceptions and address them in the video that there's a, uh, and have more than one person dialoguing about it, that there's far uh, more benefit for the student than just receiving information from one person. Right. So is it true that Alan, some, or, some of your ahead. students prefer to see the other teacher teach than the teacher they have? Yeah, you know, w when we first started making the videos, um, we would have students say, you know, I really like Mr. Bergman's better than yours. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm okay with that, and vice versa. Yep. And I think we, we've both been um, teaching long enough where we're at the point where I don't really care where they learn it. I just want them to learn it. Right. Now, you're, you're in one of the more dangerous environments in a school yeah. with acid and some, and some other chemicals that can blow things up. How do you manage the complexity of chemicals in the flipped classroom environment? Well, actually, Alan, it's safer. I, I've been teaching for 25 years, and I think now in the last four years since we, we kind of uh, figured out how to flip the classroom, we invented it or whatever, that um, it's safer because it, I used to talk to 30 kids at a time and say, here's the experiment. And the reality is in the back of the room, there was a kid texting his girlfriend. There was kids who were disengaged. Now, since we've done this flipped mastery model, when the kids actually do the experiments it's now four of them at a time and so they come and we have a little conversation me and four not me and 30 and i have a conversation with them we talked about the purpose of the experiment why they're doing the experiment the safety of the experiment i look them each in the eye and i think it, I, it is a safer environment i didn't think it would be it looks chaotic but it's a safer environment even if i've got five different lab groups happening at the same time because i've had that conversation with each group it is a safer environment well by the way we're not just flipping it with chemistry where our entire freshman program at our high school where our high school teachers um are also doing it in earth and space class in fact my earth and space students are watching right now uh, <laughs> as we do this and so i have to ask this question because i i get this question who from teachers who hear this for the first time won't parents be concerned that the homework you used to give is not showing up anymore and students are doing that in class. I wonder if you had any issues with parent complaints. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say issues. There's often lots of questions because yeah. this is obviously different than the way they went to high school. Um, from a time perspective, the time the students spend viewing one of our videos at home is actually yeah. less than the amount of time they would have spent doing paperwork from a chemistry class or whatever, exactly. you know, a problem set. So from a time perspective, they're netting more time. Then if we ever have the conversation with the parents and they're asking, why are you doing this? What, what's going on? The, the, the number one reason that we do this is to enhance the human teacher to student interaction during the class time. And when, this, when the parents realize I'm spending active, engaged, one-on-one -on -one time with their student, having a conversation with them, finding out what they do and do not understand every class period of every single day, they go, oh, thank you, yeah. I'll take it. We talk to every kid in every class every day. I have a conversation with every kid in every class every day. Oh my gosh. My previous 20 whatever years of teaching, I wasn't able to say that. The kids would walk out the back and the quiet kid in the back, no. I didn't say boo to. No, I walked through a high school last, last Friday and I must have seen 12 teachers teach. I think the majority of those teachers did not have a conversation with more than six kids. And that conversation was highly structured with a hand going up asking a question. I wouldn't really call it a conversation. It was really answering a question. That's intriguing. Every kid, every day, both of you. Yeah. I'd say one thing that piggytails on that, I think, is that in my, especially in my Earth and Space class, my, my kids are studying astronomy right now. Um, they watch the videos, but they're required to ask a question. So when they show me their notes of their video, that they've watched the no video, they must ask that question. But who has to ask that question? Every single child. In the old way, it's only the six kids who raise their hands who ask the questions. Now right. every kid has to have a, a kind of an adult interaction with me to talk about the conversation of um, galaxies or whatever the particular topic is for the day. Well, hang on, guys. We can see if there's any questions from the audience about this flip model, uh, anything that might be students. Are there any students here experience the flip model? You have a question? Yeah. I understand that the flip model would require you to interact with students um, every day and all students, but um, how would the time during your class period it be affected with how you um, time and management of the student questions? Okay, so I, I, we couldn't hear you real well, but I think your question is about the time management aspect in the uh, in the class in the classroom. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, so one, a couple things that we do there. Um, uh, some students are very capable of taking the learning objectives that we give the students and seeing what they need to do in class or at home to meet those objectives. Some other students need a lot more structure. They need me to say, okay, you know what? You need to do this today in class. You need to do this at home. You need to do this on Wednesday when I see you again in class. You need to do this thing at home after that, and so on. So I basically give them a weekly plan. Um, so that's kind of how we help the students structure their time. Then from uh, a time perspective uh, as a teacher, I'm just kind of moving around, getting to as many people as I can. Now, there are times when I'm in engaged with a small group of students and I'm not working with another group of students. So we've been able to get a couple of uh, our former students who have taken our class uh, as cadet teachers, we call them at our school, to be there to help other kids out when they need it, to give them a password to, to start taking a test and things like that. So does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Thank you. By the way, they're, they're broadcasting, I think one of your videos is up on the screen over the YouTube channel. I don't know if you can see it from your end, but it just gives an example, I think, of uh, what looks like some formulas and the two of you, the two of you look like you're speaking together in the video. Yes. Yeah, we, we think it should be conversation as we talked about earlier. It has to be a conversation instead of a just one person disseminating knowledge. Right. And one other feature, we've got some feedback from our students. Most of what we have in our videos now is because of feedback from students, right. but we just decided to plug a webcam in one day. We didn't used to have our faces in the in the picture, but our students said, oh, we like the webcam feature because you're no longer just this disembodied voice. You are my teacher on this video. And um, now we, we, think there's, there, we think there's value in that. Now we, there are people across the country who use 
the flipped model using somebody else's videos. Some teachers use our videos, yeah. and that's fine. And any any videos that are out there that people are learning from, we are all for that. We want kids to learn. That's that's the bottom line. But we also do see a value in the students seeing their teacher's face and seeing their own teacher's voice um, on on the video. There's a, there's a connection there that they're not going to get um, otherwise. That's right. So it's a big step to go to the entire flip. For teachers who are looking for an intermediary first step, rather than taking the whole year and flipping, what, what advice would you give to teachers who say, I don't know about this whole thing all at once, help me with some logical first steps? You know, it was crazy. Aaron and I decided to just say, let the heck, we're just going to do the whole thing, the whole year. That's just kind of who we are. But that said, we've actually trained teachers all over North America for the last four years on the flipped classroom. And one of our big pieces of advice is start small. Pick one unit and flip that unit. See how that works. You know, work out some of the bugs, figure that piece out, and then begin to build that. With, right. If you haven't developed your own videos, steal them from somebody else. Not really steal, but, you know, go to Khan Academy or pick somebody who's got some videos already if you're not uh, comfortable with the technology. and. By all means, if you possibly can, get a partner. Find somebody that you can work with. Those are probably our big takeaways. Anything else, Aaron? Uh, I think one other thing is um, in terms of distributing the videos, if you're right. going to produce your own for your students, find one method and do it really yeah. well. We kind of took the shotgun approach and uh, just put them everywhere. Yeah. And we just wanted kids to get them. Now, one thing that always come, kind of comes up when we talk about getting them out there is what about the kids who don't have access, who don't have internet, who don't have a computer at home? And we had to, we anticipated that, and we were able to, um, you know, get them on flash drive for kids who don't have uh, reliable internet. We kind of live out in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, and high-speed internet is sometimes hard to come by. And for the kids who don't have a computer, we just burn it on a DVD, and they can pop it in their TV player or their DVD player and watch it on their television. Well, on that note, we're going to have to end, guys. Thanks for your okay. time, and uh, look forward to talking to you later, guys. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks okay. for having Bye. 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 Yay. So now we are not lunch yet. Oh, Mrs. Oh, back to the planes. So while we're waiting, we're going to wait. Oh, at this moment, whoop, at this moment, we're, uh, we're going to go to the middle of the US and uh, with a name that uh, we're going to call Mrs. Smoke. Um, and this is about global collaboration. Hi, guys. Oh, there you are. And I, I've heard this amazing story about artwork coming from Nigeria and you helping to uh, support a school in that part of Africa. Is that a logical place to start our conversation today? We can start there. Um, we're going to introduce you to a few students. We have Maddie. Hi. <laughs> and we have Julie. Hi. 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 And we have Melissa. Hi. And these girls are the leaders to the Nigerian project. But just to give you a quick background, the idea of this is whatever I do in my classroom is must have a real world connection to it. So we were reading a book called Stealing Freedom by Elisa Carbon, and it's an underground railroad story talking about slavery and in, in during the Civil War and so forth. Well, the message of the book is the more that you know, the more education you have, the less someone can take advantage of you. And because we tie in a real world component to that, we began to explore slavery around the world and discovered that there's more slavery today in the planet than there was in 1865. So with that, we teamed up and I'm gonna have Maddie fill you in. What did we do from there? Well, what we did is we teamed up with an orphanage in Nigeria and we created a project um, called Exchanging Hope. And what we do is we um, gather different school items like laminated posters, backpacks, anything that will help them. And then we are going to ship it over to them so that way they can have a better school so they can have a better education. And then in return, they're going to send us artwork for our library. But the idea is that we improve both schools through collaboration. And it's been tremendous. So far, we have, well, golly, if you could see on the other side of this room, there's almost like half a wall packed with resources, everything from phonics readers to teaching math. It's just phenomenal. And hopefully, we're going to take a school that just has a dirt floor and cement walls and give them a school with resources. 
And whatever money is left over, we're buying them ebooks so they can continue to learn on their own time. Oh my gosh, how did you hook up with the school in Nigeria? How, how does you go about doing something like that? Well, again, I go back to the literature and determine what is a real world connection we can make. And I knew that I wanted to find something that would connect with some place in slavery issues and just happened to know somebody who knew somebody and made the connection there. It's just been phenomenal. And how about parent support? We're always, we have some parents in the audience here. And I wonder if you've had any response from the parent community on, on this kind of engaging work with authentic audience. Well, our parents have actually been very tremendous in helping us. They have helped support with any videos we need to do. We have students who stay after school. How many of you stay after and help out quite a bit? Um, we've really extended the learning not only to home, but beyond. And the parents have just been supportive in everything that we needed to do and helped with raising funds as well for shipping costs. Tell me about the after school volunteer work. Sometimes that's even more interesting than what happens in a class. Melissa, you gotta talk loud. After school, we've just been planning the different fundraisers to raise money to ship all of our materials over there. And we've had meetings. And we've had the various different meetings with other elementary schools in our area so that they can help us. And we created a project video to get other schools to be interested to support us to help contribute as well. But every year I do one huge project a year, and this year just happened to be on slavery. Last year, my freshmen here today, they also did a huge project on digital anti-piracy, if you'd be interested in hearing about that one. I would love to hear about it. I'm sure a lot of companies would too. Okay, Darren. Well, with the anti-piracy thing, we were reading um, Treasure Island, and wow. that had a lot of piracy involved in it with just your swashbuckling pirates on the open seas and not necessarily digital stuff like we do today. And that was integrated into stuff like every day thousands of people are downloading thousands of songs illegally and as well as books, music, movies, and stuff like that. And we were just trying to integrate it into that and showing that that's a bad thing and avoid raising awareness about that. So what did we create, Brandon? We created a website uh, learned to help people learn about piracy and what all it does. And Garrett, I don't know if you can you squeeze it there. You were in there, Garrett. Garrett was our artist. And so on the website that you see uh, your engineers have, you'll see Garrett's original <laughs> artwork. But he invented Pepe the Parrot. He is our whole mascot to the idea that students could encourage better digital citizenship, one of those 21st century skills, and be more ethical with digital media. And then what's the name of our project, Savannah? Do you remember? Lay Arg. Lay Arg. And where did Lay Arg come from? Well, we're showing that right now. The folks that are looking at the YouTube uh, channel are actually looking at your parrot. Uh, <laughs> pretty cool looking parrot dressed up that way. Well, you notice he's wearing a beret? Oh, if that's you... a beret. I can see that now. Yes, of course, that's a beret. <laughs> Well, we were trying to come up with a name, and because the whole thing deals with copyright and individual you know, representation of your artwork, we had to come up with something that was unique and original to ours. And we knew that all pirates said, ARG, but if you were, maybe if you were Hispanic, you would say L ARG, but if you were French, you would say Lay ARG. And we thought that just sounded cool, so we kept that title. Oh, that's where that comes from. Yes. Thank you. I get it. <laughs> And we went and did some research to make sure that wasn't copyrighted to anyone else, and it wasn't, so we have made it our own. So it's LayArg, the anti-piracing project. And it's, it, changed, it changed all of our lives. These kids today have a completely different concept of copyright. You know, it's, for the first time, they are passionate about making the world a better place, and not just here, but around the world. We did Skype calls with the Motion Picture Association of America, recording industry artists. We talked to 13 different entertainment industry groups to determine out what would it mean to have ethical use of media. And with that, they said, you know, we have all this treasure of information. What are we going to do with it? I said, that's an excellent question. What do you want to do with it? And they chose to build the website. The project has been continued this year. 
with uh, some of my students building video and building interactive games using Scratch to now make the website multimedia. So it's continuing. Wow, you've got those kids designing Scratch? Yes. Interactive media. I'm going to have to tell Mitch Resnick, you know, at the MIT Media Lab. Have you spoken to Mitch, the inventor of Scratch? No, but we'd love to chat with him. Oh, I've got to get you hooked up. Mitch the friend. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you hooked up. That'll be great fun. Awesome. M maybe you can Skype in. We, we're all about Skype, aren't we, guys? Yeah. Yes, we use Skype in our classroom quite often. So but one of, the, one of the, uh, the dreams that I would have is that certainly the majority of classrooms would be globally connected. Mathematics, science, physics, art, music, social studies, English, just the whole range. There's just no reason not to, and there's every reason to get kids engaged with authentic audience, as you have with Nigeria. I wonder what you would give for guidance for teachers who have not yet expanded the boundaries of social discourse globally. What would be some logical first steps teachers could take to follow your path? Well, I want you to just take 20 seconds. Look around the room that you're in right now. How much of it is made in the United States from the beginning of its fabrication, its idea, down to its actual production? Probably less than 1%. Probably the people sitting in the room are the only things that were made in the USA, right? Let's say yes. Let, let's <laughs> say. Well, it's Although I bet some people in this room were not made in the US, but, but go well, ahead. You know what? It's OK. Anything that's produced today in the world is a cross-country collaboration. And part of our 21st century skills is cultural awareness and dialogue and communication. So I think it comes to the idea that it's imperative that our students learn to cross-communicate around the world with different cultures because you're going to do it as an adult. It's, there's no way around it. It's just part of who we are as a global society. And the beginning stages of that would mean what can you do to make a difference in both communities? If we can help in one location, how can you help us be better learners here? And in those beginning stages, I always say start with a website, a wiki to make a place for you to communicate, incorporate Skype, and on top of that, sit down and decide what is it, the end product you both want to create and go from there. So you foresee, I, I have to ask a tough question, how many teachers in your school are globally connected as a percentage, do you think? Not enough. <laughs> so what prevents, I mean, clearly they can see, they can talk to you. You're doing it, they're in your building. Right. But they still haven't I think it takes somebody managed the opportunity. What, what's preventing them from doing that? Having another person show them how to get started. They need another person who will be willing to infuse their time to go around and say, you know what, teacher, here's a brilliant idea. If you're studying about weather around the world, let's talk to somebody who lives in that weather system. Or if you're talking about social issues that you had earlier on, people talking about the revolution in Egypt, let me help you make that connection and support you. They just not sure where to start. Well, I'll tell you what, I, have, I want to add an idea to that. All My right. sense is that the role model of a principal of a leader of a school. The role model, for example, of a principal who brings in global collaboration for a faculty meeting, okay. who uses Skype uh, and turns to an expert outside of that school for opportunity for staff development, that if there were a role model on the leadership side, that that would send a powerful message to teachers that it's good, it's good for you, it's good for your students. What do you think about that idea in addition to teachers helping teachers? Well, I think it comes back to the same thing as my students. If I want them to communicate with students overseas, it's my responsibility to give them that opportunity. If we want to, and through that, they learn better from each other around the globe. If I want to be a better teacher, and if I can talk to somebody who's in the UK, or if I can talk to somebody that's in South Africa, or maybe somebody in Canada who can help me be a better teacher, I, that's going to make all of us better in the end. You know, I, want to, I would like to tell you a story, Mrs. Smoke. I have a friend who's a principal uh, not far from your state. And she asked every teacher, what countries connect to your curriculum? Every single teacher. Three or four weeks later, she went back to her faculty with email lists of teachers in those countries. The principal did this. 
She gave every single teacher a list, and she directed every single teacher to start to communicate with their list, because their list was teaching in the countries that touched their curriculum, like Nigeria and slave trade. Mm -hmm. So it was I the principal, frankly, who made it all happen at once. I gave and my every my teacher, <laughs> every teacher, it's the only school I know in the United States. I'm sure there's more. I just don't know about them. But I am convinced that the role of a school leader is to inspire teachers to think globally. Otherwise, it's one teacher at a time, and you're already busy. And as has happened, in fact, you, you haven't had the time yet to work with every single teacher in your school. No, but you know what? I'll do whatever I can to make it this happen for anyone. And yeah, I know you would. I know you would. Well, we're going to have to uh, come to a conclusion here. I wonder, is there anyone in the audience who has questions about the opportunities presented in this story? Yes. Oh, we need a microphone. How are you doing? I'm definitely inspired by, uh, by your work. I mean, the uh, only time I had this type of experience as a, t as a student, have this global experience, was at USC. I had to wait till I was 18. So it's, it's great that you're at least involving them and in, in, uh, getting them at a young age. My question is, who inspired you at this point um, to even engage kids at this level? Um, are you asking who inspired me to be globally connected or what oh. inspires me to make them globally connected? Yes, the second, okay. the latter. Um, what inspires me is the fact that we live not in a really big town in Kansas. We live in a small little planet spot. If I can get these students an opportunity to learn about the bigger picture out there and learn that not everybody's exactly like us, then I have done my job. And if I can look at any piece of literature that we cover and decide what is the real world connection and how can my kids change the world, that's what's gonna inspire me. That's why I came a teacher, became a teacher, is I wanna change the world. And you know what? They're changing me more than I am changing the world. Uh, that's a great place to end. Thanks, Mrs. Smoke. All good. <laughs>